Good morning. We'd like to welcome you virtually to Corinth's worship service on this Easter Sunday. Hopefully you have stayed apprised of all the things that have or have not been going on at Corinth. You had an opportunity to come by and get a bulletin uh, and your communion supplies, and we are looking forward to you joining us in our worship this morning. I am very thankful to have Brian Suttles here, who will be leading our singing, Tony Cook, who will be presiding over the Lord's table, and then Carter Cook, who will be offering our closing prayer this morning. So I invite you to watch along, sing along, and participate as we worship God together this morning. Good morning. First song today is going to be Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I am my Savior and happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. To, to prepare us for the Lord's Supper this morning, we will be singing When We Meet in Sweet Communion. And then Alan, uh, pardon me, Tony will come and, and uh, oversee our, our Lord's Supper this morning. When we meet in sweet communion,
the movie makers can can highlight some of the, the physical things that he went through. But probably the most difficult thing was, uh, was the separation that he had from the father. And that's something that we don't have to experience because of what he did. And this morning as we remember the sacrifice that was made on our behalf, let's remember the fact that Jesus took our place and that uh, we no longer have to worry about being separated from God because of him. Let's pray. Dear Father, we're thankful for the bread which represents the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that hung on the cross so, so that our sins can be forgiven and that we may have hope for, in heaven one day. Be with us now as we partake of this and help us to do so in a well-pleasing manner. In Christ's name. Preparing to take of the cup, I'd like to read, uh, read from Isaiah 53, verse 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Let's pray. Dear and Father, we're thankful for the cup and fruit of the vine, which represents the blood that was shed on the cross for our sins. Father, we realize that there was, there's no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood, and we're so thankful that Jesus was willing to, to take on that, that, that sacrifice so that we may have hope for eternal life. Father, help us now as we partake. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The, uh, there's a, we are, have been very fortunate, and many of us have during this time that we have uh, we've, we've had some people that I know that have had friends, co-workers that have been affected by by the virus. But for the most part, um, our, you know, I know that our family has not experienced any true adverse effects. In fact, it's probably given us time to to appreciate one another even more. God will make. Good, good come out of, of this situation. I have no doubt, and I think that we can even start to see that in in our day in our day to day activities even now. But um, there have been people that have been adversely affected, and I, I don't want to make light of that. But I think I do want, want us to think about how how truly blessed we are, not only being in this nation, but the fact that as Christians we we have a, a we have a peace that the rest of the world does not have. And that we also uh, have a God that is so wonderful and has blessed us so, so richly. Um, there's always an opportunity to, to give, to give back to the, to the church. And uh, we'll, we want to pray for our blessings this morning and, and you know, make sure that you, uh, you take that opportunity to, get, to give back, give back to God as, you know, as best you can and when you can. Let's give thanks for our blessings. Dearly Father, we're so thankful for everything you do for us. We're thankful for our health, and we're thankful for things that you provided for us. Father, you take care of our needs and, and go even beyond that to, to such an extent that we, can, we can't be thankful enough. Father, we ask that you, that you would be with us as we give back a, a portion and we ask that you would help us to give liberally and cheerfully. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. We will sing two songs this morning before Alan comes and, and speaks to us. Number 220, uh, He Lives, will be the next song. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I serve a risen Savior, he's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian, lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King, the hope of all who seek Him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me, oh, I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Lo, in the grave he lay. We will sing all three verses and then the chorus. crisis 
Orson Welles uh, had a radio broadcast known as the War of the Worlds, and he had convinced millions of people that the earth was under attack by aliens. Many people flee their homes. Uh, many people uh, head to their houses of worship to pray and eventually uh, curse Wells' name because of the hoax that he perpetrated. Another example happened in 1957. Uh, the BBC, British Broadcast Company, uh, had a news documentary about the Swiss spaghetti harvest. The Swiss spaghetti harvest, and it depicted farmers pulling strands of spaghetti from trees. The network became overrun with callers asking where they can buy their own spaghetti tree. Now I say all that to say this, there are many people who see the resurrection of Jesus as being a fictitious claim, as being a hoax. Uh, not long after Jesus was raised from the dead did conspiracy theories begin to circulate. Even in the Bible we have examples of people saying that they have stolen our Lord's Body. There are those that say he didn't really die, uh, that he just passed out on the cross, and somehow, as Tony shared earlier, despite all of these horrific injuries that he sustained prior to and during the crucifixion, somehow he survived that without proper medical treatment. Uh, there are others who will concede that he died, but that the disciples stole the body of Jesus. And I am here to tell you this morning that Jesus is risen, no fooling. This is no April Fool's prank. Now before we get into our text, I want to share with you for a minute the power of an eyewitness. Uh, what is the most crucial testimony in the court of law? Actually, there are three. Uh, the first one is a picture or video taken of a person committing the crime. Uh, but depending on the quality of the video, depending on uh, the legitimacy of the picture, that evidence can be ruled inadmissible. A, a second uh, witness is an eyewitness who testifies what he or she saw. But even then, depending on how reliable the person is, his or her testimony can be thrown out. The most powerful testimony of all is the testimony of two or more eyewitnesses giving the same condemning testimony. Almost nothing can defeat the testimony of multiple witnesses. Now with that as the backdrop for our lesson this morning, let us turn to our text from John 20, and we're going to discuss the truthfulness of how Jesus is not in the grave, He is not there, He is risen just as He said. Our text for the morning from John 20, beginning in verse 18, says this, But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid Him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing Him to be a gardener, she said to Him, Sir, if you have carried Him away, tell me where you have laid Him, and I will take Him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these 
things. And so from this text, I want us to begin by discussing what Mary saw at the tomb. The first thing that Mary saw at the tomb were the two angels. Uh, two angels seated there in the tomb. This reminds me a little bit about the mercy seat. Remember the mercy seat that sat atop the Ark of the Covenant and there were two angels that were adorned and, and sitting there? Well, that was a sign of the Old Covenant. Here we have a sign of a New Covenant. Different angels, yes, live angels as opposed to the graven angels that were on the Ark of the Covenant. But here these angels are. And where was the ark placed in the temple? It was placed in the most holy place. Or the holy of holies. And here in the tomb, we see what might be called a holy of holies. It is the place where God meets humanity. And it is the place where sins were forgiven. We oftentimes emphasize the cross as being a place where our sins are forgiven, and that is certainly true, but we also need to remember that a dead Savior saves no one. It is a living Savior that saves. And so just as the cross is the place where the blood was shed for our sins, the tomb, specifically the empty tomb, becomes the holy of holies. Because as Tony pointed out, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness but now He lives and reigns for all of eternity, seated at the right hand of God where He makes intercession for you and for me. Only the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies, but because of Jesus' death on the cross and His resurrection, you and I can come before God's throne of grace ourselves. We are a kingdom of priests as Christians. And so the first thing that Mary saw were the two angels, symbols, I would argue, of the new covenant that was established because of the cross and because of the empty tomb. But the second thing that she saw was a resurrected Jesus. She thought it was a gardener. Now, we're not 100% sure why it is that she did not recognize Jesus. There are several possibilities. One of the possibilities is that Jesus' body and face was so marled and mangled by the crown of thorns, uh, by the multiple stripes that He took, uh, by the crown of thorns on His head, that He would have been unrecognizable. It's possible that this was a miraculous event. Either way, she did not recognize Jesus. Not at all unlike the disciples on the road to Emmaus. It might be that her grief clouded her eyes. We all know that grief uh, can cause us to not think clearly and people are encouraged not to make major life decisions during times of grief. So it may have just been her grief. But whatever it is, she did not recognize Jesus. She assumed that He was a gardener. And I think that there is an interesting point to make here. Not sure how far to push it. But remember, Paul talks about how Jesus Christ was the second Adam. And what Adam got wrong in the Garden of Eden, Jesus got right. Well, it's interesting that Adam was the first gardener and Jesus became a second gardener. And at least in the eyes of Mary, at least for a couple of minutes. And so Mary sees two angels at the tomb and a resurrected Jesus at the tomb. And as important as that is, what she saw pales in comparison to what she heard. What did Mary hear at the tomb? The first thing that Mary heard at the tomb was the voice of Jesus with a definition of a new relationship. Because Jesus died and yes, was raised from the dead, we now experience, you and I, Mary as well, now experience a new relationship. Jesus uses a personal intimate name for Mary. And this is an important thing for you and I to realize as well. In John 10, verse 3, the Word of God says this, The sheep hear His voice, and He calls His own sheep by name and leads them out. When He has brought out all of His own, He goes out before them, and the sheep follow Him, for they know His voice. Paul in his letter to the Romans referred to the cross as foolishness at least how the world views it. 
And here's the difference, and, or here's the reason. An individual who is not one of God's sheep does not recognize the shepherd's voice. And so yes, there are those who want to say that the Bible is just a collection of fairy tales or stories. They want to say that those who believe in the Word of God are, are naive or uh, as uh, Marx referred to it, the opiate of the masses. And the reason that they make those assumptions is because they don't recognize the shepherd's voice. When you recognize the shepherd's voice, the Word of God begins to have power and meaning. Again, as Tony said, we as Christians have peace. It is a peace that the world does not have. Why is that? Because we recognize the shepherd's voice. And we hear and understand the shepherd's voice when he said, let not your hearts be troubled. We believe the shepherd's voice when he says, in this world you will have trouble, but take courage or be at peace. I have overcome the world. We hear and believe the shepherd's voice when he says, no temptation has overcome you, but that which is common to man and God will not allow you to be tested or tempted beyond what you can bear. We hear the shepherd's voice and we believe the shepherd's voice when he says, my grace is sufficient for you. Does it make sense to the world? No, it doesn't. Why? Because they're not his sheep. They don't recognize his voice. And so this is an emphasis over the spiritual, over the physical. And the resurrection of Jesus is better for us. Because John 16, verse 7, we read this, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send Him to you. Jesus is telling Mary not to cling to Him. She's got to ascend. I've always thought it interesting, the word goodbye. Uh, there's never any good in goodbyes. And Mary is undoubtedly sensing that and feeling that as well. But Jesus says, in His case, there is a good in goodbye. And so He says, don't cling to Me. I must ascend into heaven. But when I ascend into heaven, I'm going to send a helper. John will go on to say, it is the Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit. And again, the world doesn't know Him. So Mary heard and we heard the voice of Jesus in defining a new relationship. He is no longer Lord, Lord, but we are His friends, Jesus said. I no longer call you servants, but friends. Secondly, we see the voice of Jesus with a declaration of new relatives. In verse 17, He goes on to say, Go to My brothers and say to them, I am ascending to My Father and your Father, to My God and your God. The disciples had been called servants, and friends. Now they are called brothers. In Matthew 12, 49, we read this, and stretching out his hand towards his disciples, he says, here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my father is my brother and sister and mother. And the good news is we can be family to Jesus. As Christians, we are family to Jesus, but anyone can be family to Jesus. We can be heirs of promise. Brothers and sisters. Paul said it this way in Romans 8. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. Paul would tell the churches of Galatia, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And so Mary hears and we hear the voice of Jesus declaring a new definition of relationship. A declaration of new relatives. And then finally, Mary heard the voice of Jesus with a description of a new responsibility. Mary was the first witness of the resurrection. This is interesting. This is interesting because in Jesus' day, women to a large extent were disenfranchised in many ways. 
And while there are those who oftentimes will take pot shots at Christianity because of their stances on women's roles in the church or whatever the case might be along those lines, it is significant to note that everywhere Christianity has gone, it has dignified the role of womanhood. And all you have to do is start in Jerusalem and go west and start in Jerusalem and go east. All you have to do is get a map of Paul's missionary journeys and see that he went west and you can see how society across the board, but even the roles of women specifically, have been dignified with the spread of Christianity. And so it is significant that it was a woman who was the first witness of the resurrection because women were not allowed to witness in court. And so here we see the first examples of Christianity bringing a greater sense of dignity to women specifically. But with the privilege of that encounter came responsibility. When we encounter Jesus, we too have a responsibility to share to other people. In Isaiah 6, beginning in verse 8, the Word of God tells us there, all the way back in the Old Testament, one aspect of that responsibility. There, Isaiah says, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. And so all the way back in Isaiah, we hear the words of the importance of going and telling. And the fact of the matter is, Mary had great news to share. And that's what Jesus told her to do. And you and I have great news to share as well. Matthew 28, verse 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw Him, they worshipped Him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. There are those who have a general view of Christianity that is depressing, devoid of joy, that... The church is a place of obligation in light of eternity. And part of that is based on our consumerism mindset. We choose churches based on consumerism. What will the church do for me? Or, or what are my preferences in terms of the song style? Uh, or the song leader's ability? Contemporary, traditional, whatever the case might be. What if we were to look for a church that helps us get to know God? What if we were to look for a church where we knew more than just the rules and the instructions? What if we knew a church and attended a church that got us to know God? Back in the Exodus, God redeemed, his, redeemed Israel for Himself. He redeemed His people. And He called them to Him at Mount Horeb. There they got to know God. They got to learn about worship and who God is and what He expected of them. And once they got to know God, once they understood what He expected of them and that He loved them and rescued them from slavery, they were willing to do what the Lord told them to do. Some of the instructions that God gives us deal with an abundant life, certainly in the future, but also in the here and now. We began with the importance of eyewitnesses. Mary is but the first. He appeared to the eleven apostles. He appeared to two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And the Word of God tells us that He appeared to over 500 other people in addition to that. The weight of multiple witnesses does not get turned over in court. Well, today you've seen and we've discussed what Mary heard at the tomb. We talked about how sheep hear the shepherd's voice. And so my question for you this morning is, are you listening to the voice of God? 
Are you listening to the voice of God in your life? He may be calling in a still, small voice like He did Elijah. He may be calling in a raging storm like He did Jonah. In an unusual situation as with Moses, it came in a proclamation of His Word at Pentecost as well. And that voice of God, whether you're listening to it or not, is a personal call to become a part of of His kingdom. His family. It's a personal call for a new relationship. For new relatives. And it is a call to personal responsibility. And He wants you and He wants me to be known by His name. 2 Timothy 2 verse 9. But God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are His. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord, depart from iniquity. Are you listening to His voice this morning? You should. Because yes, He hung on a cross. But He was raised. The evidence supports it. And even though we are going through a challenging time right now in our church history, in our state history, national history, and world history, we as Christians are blessed. Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Because He lives, all fear is gone. Because I know He holds the future. And life is worth living just because He lives. No fool, He lives. Are you listening to His voice? Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. Uh, we're going to close out our service by singing Because He Lives. We will sing the first and last verse. God sent His Son. They called Him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and died to buy my Please be with us as we leave here and please be with everybody at home watching this in Jesus' name.